German Field Marshal von Kleist called it the best tank of World War II. Panzer leader General Heinz Guderian, upon first encountering the Red Army's T-34, said the tank enjoyed vast superiority over German tanks. The Soviets wove legendary tales around its incredible performance on the battlefields of Eastern Europe. But what exactly made the T-34 the best tank of World War II? Design on the T-34 began in late 1930, when the Red Army was mostly equipped with T-26 or Bistrachodny light tanks, which were fast and agile units but were seriously lacking in protection and firepower. Both tanks had seen action during the Spanish Civil War, when Soviet forces backed up Spanish communists, and during the Soviet Union's undeclared border war with Japan. During the 1938 to 1939 border skirmish with Japan, the Red Army's tanks were roundly defeated by the low-powered but still superior Japanese Type 95 tanks. Infantrymen also scored many kills on Soviet tanks by assaulting them with Molotov cocktails, which turned the tank into a giant fireball when flaming gasoline dripped through chinks in the poorly welded armor and into the tank's engine compartment. Clearly, the Soviet Union needed a replacement tank for its ground forces, and it needed one as soon as possible. Though Hitler had declared a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union, its poor performance against both Japan and then later against Finland in the Winter War sent a strong signal that the Red Army was weak, and there was nothing Stalin feared more than Hitler turning his forces loose on him. The first prototypes of the T-34 entered production in 1939 and featured a coil spring Christie suspension, similar to the previous BT series of tanks, allowing them to achieve higher speeds than other tanks in service around the world. The new track design also gave the entire tank an incredibly low ground pressure of 0.64 kg per centimeter square, or just slightly higher than the pressure the average human footprint exerts on the ground. This means that the T-34 would be much more maneuverable and less likely to get bogged down by snow and thick mud, two environments that were intimately familiar to people living on Russia's western steppes. The gasoline engine, so vulnerable to going up in flames from Molotov attack, was replaced with a diesel engine, giving it enough horsepower to push the T-34 along at speeds of up to 34 miles an hour. This made the T-34 10 miles per hour faster than the German Panzer III or Panzer IV. It also featured a revolutionary sloped armor design that was 45 mm thick. The 60 degree slope on the armor effectively meant that any incoming round had to penetrate an extra 5 mm of armor, increasing armor protection without adding excess weight. The slope, however, also helped ensure that most incoming projectiles on a horizontal trajectory would bounce harmlessly off the armor. The main gun was a major upgrade over previous Soviet designs and featured a 76mm cannon with a muzzle velocity of around 2,000 feet per second, allowing the T-34 to score kills on any other tank in the world at even long ranges. With so much fanfare around the production of the T-34, designer Mikhail Koshkin completed two prototypes in January of 1940 and decided to subject the tanks to an extremely grueling trial by fire. He drove both tanks from Ukraine to Moscow, or about 745 miles, and then to the border with Finland, on to Kiev, and lastly back to the factory in Kharkov. The incredible endurance test proved that the tanks were built to last and structurally sound, and only minor modifications were required to the suspension and drivetrain before the tank went into full-scale production. However, Koshkin ended up contracting pneumonia during the journey and would die, replaced as head of the T-34 program by his deputy, Alexander Morozov. With a spectacular endurance trial under its belt, full-scale production of the T-34 began in September of 1941 at the Kharkov Komintern locomotive plant with concurrent production beginning six months later at the Stalingrad tractor factory. The tank would see four different versions, all equipped with the mighty 76mm gun, and the first version of the T-34 was formally recognized by the Red Army as the Model 1940. Unfortunately, though Soviet engineering was still catching up with the rest of the world, its manufacturing still lacked the raw skill and expertise needed to build modern tanks. Instead of the much more powerful and safer V-12 diesel engine, many early T-34s were instead fitted with the MT-17 gasoline engines due to the difficulty in the manufacturing process of the V-12s. The initial L-11 76mm gun was also quickly found to have very poor penetration capability against armored targets and was hastily replaced with the F-34 76mm gun. With an improved muzzle velocity of 2130 feet per second, the new cannon proved more effective at punching through German armor, 
and the new model of T-34 was designated as the Model 1941, seeing as it began to enter service in the summer of 1941. On June 22, 1941, Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa, his planned killing stroke to defeat the communist government of the Soviet Union. With more than 3 million soldiers, 150 divisions, and 3,000 tanks making up three army groups, the German advance created an initial front more than 1,800 miles long. Initially, the Germans scored victory after victory, pushing the Soviet forces even further back. However, a few months after the start of the offensive, the Red Army began to receive the T-34 in force, and the Germans were shocked at the mighty new tanks leading Soviet counterattacks. German Panzer III's found that their 50mm gun was all but useless against the sloped frontal armor of the T-34, as was the 50mm Pac-38 anti-tank gun used by support units. German tank commanders were soon finding out that their only hope of stopping the T-34 was to outmaneuver it. No easy feat given that the T-34 was light on its feet and very capable within the muddy and snowy conditions of western Russia, while heavy German panzers tended to bog down. Nonetheless, superior German training saw Soviet forces outmaneuvered time and again, and the T-34 suffered heavy casualties. Though even with their inferior training and communications, T-34s managed to stop the German advance into the Soviet Union. For all its strengths though, the T-34 had some serious drawbacks as well. First was the poor Soviet worksmanship, as the T-34 was largely built by an inexperienced workforce with very low expertise. The need to hurry tanks through the production process saw many corners cut, and overall while the T-34 was one of the best designed tanks of the Second World War, it was often betrayed in reality by the poor worksmanship that went into its construction. Physical failures experienced by the tank were often more the fault of the rushed labor that went into its construction and less a fault with the core design itself. The T-34 also had a two-man manually traversed turret, which required the commander to also act as a gunner. This would place a huge workload on the tank commander, which would take precious time away from his most vital task, actually commanding the tank. For platoon leaders, this made maintaining command and control over an entire platoon, and not just his own tank, virtually impossible, and was one of the leading causes for the poor performance of Soviet tank forces against the Germans. The turret also lacked a basket, or raised floor which moved along with the turret, as the turret turned from side to side, which meant that the tank crews were constantly in danger of tripping over spent shells as the turret moved. Visibility was also a major problem for T-34 tank commanders, as the tank lacked a cupola and periscope standard amongst all other allied tanks. This problem was rectified in the T-34 model 1943, but until then tank commanders often entered into battle with the main hatch physically open, ducking behind it as they struggled to make sense of the battlefield. Needless to say, riding into battle with your main hatch open was a very bad idea, but better than riding into battle blind. The armor of the T-34 was also extremely rigid and would fail to provide any give when struck by a round. This meant that the force of the impacting round may not penetrate the thick armor, but could still generate lethal steel splinters on the inside of the tank, which would kill or seriously injure crew members. The steep slope of the armor also made the T-34 a very cramped machine. And when the US Army engineers tested a T-34 in 1942, they were amazed that the Soviets could fit four fully equipped crewmen inside the tank. The cramped space, however, also meant that the sides of the hull had to be lined with fuel cells, which could be easily breached if hit by armor-piercing rounds. The other major drawback of the T-34 was the lack of a radio on each tank, with only the tanks of a platoon leader being equipped with a radio. Communications between tanks was instead meant to be done with flags, an absolutely flabbergasting proposition amidst the ferocity of tank combat. While German tanks were coordinating with each other via radio, the Soviet tankers were expected to somehow wave flags at each other in order to coordinate their movements, and this with the T-34's notoriously low visibility. As a result, despite the capabilities of the T-34, Soviet tankers were routinely outfought by the Germans. The most serious vulnerability of the T-34, though, was the very poor worksmanship, with random tests of newly completed T-34s in 1942 showing that only 7% were free of major defects. In 1943, random T-34s were taken directly from the production lines and subjected to a 300km reliability trial, with less than 8% of T-34s being able to complete the trial without breaking down. Just on their way to combat, Soviet tank brigades were known to experience losses of 30% to 50% of their tanks in transit, without even seeing enemy action. 
and the average T-34 lasted less than 124 miles before needing major repairs or overhauls. A T-34 could barely get through its first full tank of diesel before needing repair. With all these vulnerabilities, it can be hard to truly consider the T-34 the best tank of World War II, but it's important to remember that many of the T-34 defects were down to the poor worksmanship of what was essentially a hastily assembled labor force of unskilled peasants. The Soviets were desperate, with their backs up against the wall, and it showed in the many, many defects built into the T-34. Yet the core design on paper was always good, and its tactical limitations and vulnerabilities were quickly addressed, with fixes implemented into new models. However, one of the key qualities that makes the T-34 the best tank of World War II was the ease with which it could be produced. With the Soviets producing over 30,000 T-34s between 1941 and 1943, versus just over 5,000 German Panzer IVs, the T-34 was truly great because it may not have been the best engineered design, but it was a very strong design that could be built quickly and cheaply even with a very inexperienced and poor quality workforce, which turned out to be a critical advantage over the Germans' Tiger and Panzer tanks. What do you think was really the best tank of World War II? Why or why not? Let us know in the comments, and as always, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more great content.